tonight, frustration in northern Manitoba. What seemed like a promising lead goes cold after an exhaustive search. We're still going to remain uh, you know, on guard and uh, obviously uh, working with the RCMP. With the suspects still at large, where does the search through the woods go from here? I don't know um, why this happened and I'm still in shock. Murder in Markham. Police outside Toronto charge a 23-year-old man with four counts of first-degree murder. What we know so far. If he gets re-elected, what happens to this country? Civil war. <laughs> and after President Trump lashes out at the city of Baltimore on Twitter, our Paul Hunter hits the streets to find out how residents are responding. This is The National. It is day seven of the massive manhunt for two young men suspected of three murders in British Columbia. But today the RCMP said a trail that seemed so promising just last night seems to have gone cold. Our officers are on, on the ground, have not made contact with the individuals. And so we are not yet in a position to confirm that these are the wanted suspects. The main search had only just moved from Gillam, Manitoba to York Landing. But after an exhaustive search of that area, police have come up blank so far. Angela Johnston has more from York Landing tonight where the situation may be getting ready to change again. It's a serious endeavor, tracking down two fugitive suspects. The RCMP is scaling down now, but not before pulling out all of the stops from above and on the ground. Officers carefully comb through this remote community of about 500 people in northern Manitoba, a place so remote most people usually get here by ferry or air. Over the past 24 hours, York Landing found itself thrust into an international spotlight, becoming the centre of a massive hunt for suspects Cam McLeod and Briar Schmigelski. Yesterday, the Indigenous-led Bear Clan Patrol spotted two people matching the suspect's description near the local dump and lagoon. Since then, the police presence swelled and was a bit overwhelming for Travis Biggity. A little bit, yeah. You know, none of us have, none of the Bear Clan members have slept too often. Like, we sleep like three, four hours and we're up and we want to go patrol. We'll be glad when this is over. And he's not the only one. 12-year-old Savannah Colomb says she thinks she saw one of the suspects near her family's home. She says the man was Caucasian, wearing a camouflage jacket like Schmigelski's. I thought he was going to come into the house. And how are you feeling today? Good. Because? They are here to keep us safe. All the police? It, feels, it makes you feel better seeing them around? Yeah. Still, RCMP stressed today that they have not been able to substantiate the tip about the suspects in the community. And York Landing's chief says officers are starting to pull out, moving back to Gillam to reorganize. Our number one priority again is to find uh, these individuals so that we can at least go from there. We're still going to remain uh, you know, on guard and uh, obviously uh, working with the RCMP obey all, all the commands that they have in order. For myself, I don't, I'm not scared, but it's the only thing I'm worrying about my step, I mean, I mean my um, foster son and my grandchild here. It's a search that has created fear and anxiety for many in this part of the province. And as the hunt enters its second week, there are still very few answers. Angela Johnston, CBC News, York Landing. And so again tonight, the question for police, are these two suspects hiding in the forest, perhaps on the move? So let's take a closer look at the area. This is challenging terrain, woods, bog, it's teeming with insects. And among the animals in the area, wolves, black bears, even polar bears. By car, it's more than three and a half hours from Gillam to York Landing on Highway 280. By foot, there are two major overland routes. One, a broad path cut through the bush for hydro lines. The other, the train tracks that run roughly parallel. Another possibility is water. The Nelson River connects Split Lake near York Landing to Stevens Lake, where Gillam lies on the southern shore. Now remember, the police operation in York Landing was a response to a tip from the Bear Clan. It is an Indigenous-led group that serves as a combination of neighborhood watch and community outreach program. 
Some of their volunteers were in York Landing to patrol the neighborhood and reassure people there. Our Katie Nicholson walks us through what the Bear Clan's all about. Whether they're picking up dirty needles in unrelenting heat or looking for missing persons in unforgiving cold, the members of Bear Clan suit up every night to walk Winnipeg's streets on a mission to make them more safe for the vulnerable. The community has an ally now where they, they felt kind of isolated before. People are coming out of their houses, they're, they're meeting with us, they're talking with us, they're sharing with us. That girl's only 13. We patrolled with the Bear Clan's boss, James Favel, last summer. Missing girl, right? The former trucker awakened the Bear Clan from its decades-long hibernation after the 2014 death of Tina Fontaine, the exploited 15-year-old whose body was pulled from the Red River. People aren't always comfortable speaking with the Winnipeg police. They come and they speak with us. Of course. Its volunteer patrols gather information from people too afraid to speak with police. They also offer comfort, safety, food and hope to those who live in some of the city's poorest neighbourhoods. In the Anishinaabe tradition, the Bear Clan are the protectors of our community. Professor Negan Sinclair says the Bear Clan arose because of a dire need. The long-standing relationship that's been fractured between Indigenous peoples and different institutions, particularly the police, the Bear Clan has filled in that space. Now, Bear Clan builds that much-needed trust. One of the reasons its volunteers have been sent to calm frayed nerves in York Landing and Fox Lake, rattled by the intense manhunt. It's bridged that gap that was missing before. Not so long ago, many of the people who walk with Bear Clan might have avoided Sergeant Brian Krupolo. Now he sits on its board. Having them see me sit at the board chair and to be part of the, uh, the Bear Clan den, uh, to show up in uniform and not in uniform, to, to be available to speak to them, uh, they open up to me a lot more. Bear Clan has been so successful in four short years, it has expanded with chapters in five other provinces. From inside out, we're healing, we're growing, we're empowering, we're educating. A testament to what can be done when people come together. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. The Bear Clan doesn't have police authority and they are there to help officers. Bear Clan members are instructed not to confront suspects and police say they're not taking part in the search, but Winnipeg police have trained the Bear Clan in de-escalation techniques, including talking to people going through crises. Members are also trained to deliver first aid, uh, applying tourniquets and administering drugs to prevent opioid overdoses. And we'll be checking in again on our top story later in the program with the CBC's Austin Grabish. He's in Split Lake, Manitoba. But Andrew, you're also looking into a case of multiple murder. Yeah, except there's no manhunt in the Toronto suburb of Markham. The suspect's already in custody. A 23-year-old charged with four counts of first-degree murder. He was arrested at a home where police found four bodies inside. Angelina King looks into a case that may have a disturbing online dimension. While police search for evidence at a murder scene, they have chosen not to say if they're examining this an apparent confession and photos of the crime scene circulating online. Late Saturday night, chilling messages were sent to members of an online gaming community by someone known to them as Minhaz. He said he'd been lying to his family for years. In messages obtained by CBC News, the gamer known as Minhaz said he had dropped out of university but told his parents he was at class. He wrote, I did this because I don't want my parents to feel the shame of having a son like me. He said he had told his family he would graduate on Sunday and that he had killed them the day before. I wanted them to die, he wrote, so that they didn't suffer knowing how much of a pathetic subhuman I was. It's all very selfish. CBC News has not independently verified that the person sending the messages is 23-year-old Minhaz Zaman, now charged with four counts of first-degree murder. But a woman who rented a basement apartment in the home for five years says this photo from the gaming profile is a match for the accused. Um, why this happened and I'm still in shock. Amira Riaz says Zaman lived with his parents, sister and grandmother. I never heard him once even single shouting and so, always smiling, always helpful. When police arrived at their home yesterday afternoon, they arrested Zaman at the front door. 
Inside, police say they found the bodies of three women and one man. This scene is going to be held for quite some time as there's a lot of work uh, for our forensic identification to be doing inside the residence here. Zaman briefly appeared in court today wearing glasses and a black t-shirt, giving his name in a soft voice. Neighbors here say they're shocked by the police presence on their peaceful block, especially for something as disturbing as a quadruple murder. Officers say they're not searching for any other suspects and public safety is not at risk. Angelina King, CBC News, Markham, Ontario. Well, they vowed to never stop fighting for their kids. And after months of protests in Ontario, parents of autistic children can finally put away those signs and declare victory, at least for now. Today, Doug Ford's Conservative government said it is reversing changes to the province's autism program, which is a huge relief for many families. But as Jacqueline Hansen reports, there are political considerations at play here, too. Adam Chavez is seven years old, but because of his autism, many of his social and academic skills are behind. We all want my son Adam to be independent and being able to have a job for them for himself to be able to be successful. Adam gets 22 hours of therapy a week, but it's not cheap. $70,000 a year. It had been fully covered, but under Ford's initial redesign, Adam's funding would be cut to $5,000. I think my greatest fear is, you know, passing away and my son is not in a place where he's able to care for himself. Um, it puts pressure on me and my husband. We have listened and I'm here today because we have learned. Minister Todd Smith took over the file in June and took on damage control. It's clear to me that we didn't get the redesign right the first time. And I'm here to tell you that we will now. The new plan is a needs-based program. It's not the first time Ford has had to walk back a policy move in the wake of fierce opposition. In May, he reversed a contentious funding cut to municipalities. We write 1,000% of the time. I wish we were right 1,000% of the time. The government is suffering in the polls, and it's unclear if the reversals are helping. Does it staunch the bleeding? It depends. And even if it staunches it, they're not in a good position right now. You're doing a great job. At a summer skills camp for children and adults with autism, Sue Walters visits her two autistic sons. You're doing a beautiful, beautiful job. job. With a federal election around the corner, she believes today's shift is politically motivated to boost support for the conservative brand. We feel like pawns, and we are. Autism families are pawns at this time. But like many parents, she's still hopeful that a needs-based program will recognize her sons and help her help them. Though she'll have to wait to find out, details of the new program won't be known for months. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Richmond Hill, Ontario. Okay, you could call it the second Battle of Baltimore. The U.S. president's standoff over that city continues, Ian. That's right, Andrew. After Donald Trump's Twitter tirade against black Congressman Elijah Cummings and his district over the weekend, he's doubling down today. All the while, in Baltimore and elsewhere, opposition voices are growing louder. It was important for us to uh, really call attention to racist, xenophobic uh, comments that the president made. Kalila Harris worked for Barack Obama as an advisor on education for black Americans. She's also one of 149 African-American Obama staffers who co-signed this opinion piece published last week by The Washington Post decrying what they call racist attacks on four congresswomen. As for calling Baltimore a disgusting, rodent-infested mess, Harris calls that a dangerous distraction. When you have someone who seems incapable of discussing policy, you then pivot and focus on um, other issues. Civil rights activist Al Sharpton says the comments are simply coded racism. But he has a particular venom for blacks and people of color. He doesn't refer to any of his other opponents or critics as infested. Trump fired back, calling Sharpton a con man who hates whites and cops. So Paul Hunter went to the city of Baltimore today to find out how residents are reacting. On the streets of Baltimore, where pride in country is evident everywhere, so too today, fury at this country's president. Fuck Trump. 
and frustration and a firmly held ugly belief. I'm angry, I'm pissed. I, I mean, I wish I could. <laughs> I'm just angry and pissed. I mean, it's, it's, in, it's wrong. It's inappropriate. You know what I mean? Do you believe your president is a racist? Definitely. At 100%. He's definitely a racist. It's hardly the first time Donald Trump has been labeled that way, but here today, it came with a fierceness. When I think of Trump, I think of a man of no integrity, man. You know what I'm saying? No, no ethics, no morals. You know what I'm saying? No value to say the things that he say. He's a child. He's in a grown man's body. He think this is a game. It's not a game. Trump's branding of Baltimore as unfit for humans, infested with rodents, is widely deemed coded racism. Indeed, Baltimore has its challenges. The city's downtown harbor is surrounded by some of the poorest urban neighborhoods in the country. But that it's a mostly black city, specifically targeted by Trump, with that phrasing, irks. When he uses words like infested, how does that make you feel? It makes me feel like he's targeting us. Say those we spoke with today, they know many of Trump's supporters not only accept it from him, they welcome it. A divided country, the chasm widening, driven, they say, by Trump. Disappointed, upset, hurt. Um, I want him out of office, you know? Help us, don't talk about us, help us. And breathe the city for us. Make it a better city. Don't talk about us, you know? And why is someone racist in office anyway? How did he get in office? We really need to come together and, and put our foot down and tell Trump that we don't want a president like that right now. If he gets reelected, what happens to this country? Civil War. <laughs> and Paul joins us now from Baltimore. And today, from what I understand, Paul, it was not difficult getting people to speak with you. Yeah, you got that straight. Um, look, I've been to Baltimore a lot over the years. And generally speaking, there is a wariness here when it comes to the media, particularly in places like West Baltimore, where we went today, uh, where, I mean, to be blunt about it, um, where a great number of black people simply don't trust that the media wants to tell their story. And I, I mean, on previous visits I've made here, a great part of my work has been about convincing people that, no, that is the story we want to tell. And, you know, it has worked out fine in the past. But today it was different. Today people came up to us. They knew what we were there for. They knew what we were talking about. And they wanted to tell the world that Donald Trump isn't right for the job, that Donald Trump has got to go, that Donald Trump is a racist, and that they can't wait for 2020. On that aspect alone, Ian, it was a remarkable day. Paul Hunter in Baltimore, thank you. Here's some of the other stories we're following tonight on The National. Confirmation, a six-year-old boy was one of three killed in a festival shooting in California. We got shot. <laughs> A 19-year-old gunman opening fire on crowds at the Gilroy Garlic Festival yesterday afternoon. It sent people fleeing in panic. The youngest victim has been identified as Stephen Romero, his mother and grandmother among the 13 injured. A 13-year-old girl and a man in his 20s were also killed. It's believed the shooter cut through a fence to get into the grounds. He was shot and killed by officers, and investigators are looking into the possibility of a second suspect. About 6 million Canadians have been affected by a data breach at Capital One. The hack largely targeting U.S. customers. The company says 100 million people there had their personal information accessed. That includes names, addresses, birth dates, and self-reported income. About 1 million Canadian, Canadian social insurance numbers were also compromised. The FBI has arrested a former Seattle software engineer. And still ahead on The National, we'll return to our top story, the ongoing manhunt for two murder suspects who have evaded police for a week, plus the communities at the center of it all. And a quick thinking teen who became her own hero in our moment. Well, I think she's a, she's a miracle. God was with her because she managed to get out of the car and come to my house and then run down the road, and that's all with injuries. Imagine surviving that and making it out to run for help. Her story ahead. But first, Hayden Kruger might have thought making 150 grand a year playing video games was pretty good, but this weekend he walked away from a tournament with more than a million bucks. 
We introduced you to Kruger on Friday. He's better known as Elevate in the gaming world. He's just 17 years old, originally from Calgary, and he'd been practicing up to 12 hours a day to prepare for the Fortnite World Cup in New York. Going over my film, going over like what mistakes we've made, our good plays, making new strategies, applying those into our games. Well, that practice paid off big time. Kruger and his teammate finished third. And third place money, $2.4 million Canadian, split two ways. It's really, really awesome. All my family was here at the event pretty much. They're all cheering me on. <laughs> They're all going crazy when I got a kill or like, like freaking out like about the leaderboards and stuff. So it was, it's really awesome to see like my family supporting me and my passion. So where does a millionaire gamer go from here? Well, Kruger says he wants to win more money, of course, keep building his online brand, and surprise, surprise, keep getting better at Fortnite. Global Affairs Canada is urging Russia to respect the right to freedom of assembly and expression. Moscow police arrested more than a thousand protesters over the weekend. Demonstrators were demanding that opposition candidates be allowed to run in upcoming municipal elections. And now, the prominent opposition activist behind those protests claims he might have been poisoned. Russian authorities have a different explanation, but as Susan Ormiston reports, his sudden illness is suspiciously similar to those experienced by other Kremlin critics. Alexei Navalny called for an opposition protest over the weekend, and he paid for it. The demonstration in central Moscow was large, the response vicious. Over a thousand people were detained, but Navalny was already locked up in jail. In a blog post, today he revealed his face and neck began to redden and itch on Saturday. By Sunday, his eyes were like slits, his eyelids swollen to the size of ping pong balls. His personal doctor said some kind of chemical agent caused contact dermatitis. She wasn't allowed initially to examine him. Nor was his lawyer, Olga Mikhailova, who says he was poisoned by some chemical agent but no one knows what or where it was. In hospital, the swelling came down after Navalny was injected with multiple courses of prednisone, a steroid. Today, he was sent back to detention over objections from his physician. She wanted him observed longer. Navalny says he is not allergic to anything and has never before had a reaction. He is Vladimir Putin's most prominent foe, arrested 10 times. We met him two years ago when he was fighting fraud charges, trumped up, he says. Of course, they will find me guilty. And everyone in this uh, office, including prosecutor office, including judge, everyone understand that I'm non-guilty. His mysterious illness raises suspicions because of other Russian attempts to neutralize opponents. Sergei Skripal, a former Russian spy who almost died last year from a nerve agent in Salisbury. And Alexander Litvinenko, a retired Russian officer in the security service. He did die of polonium poisoning in London. Two years ago, Navalny himself was blinded temporarily when green dye was thrown in his face. Recent protests have brought on some of the most violent reaction in years. Fears are the beatings may not be the only way to send a message to the Kremlin's opponents. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, London. And still ahead on The National, long-term care that lets you stay in your long-term relationship. Canadian couples are often split up by the system as they age and their needs change. Ahead, we'll go to Sweden, where great pains are taken to make sure partners can stay together. But first, more on our developing top story. Where are the men wanted for three murders? Well, it's causing a lot of fear and anxiety, like with the people around here. I'll take you to the community suddenly at the center of violence, fear, and national attention. We are not yet in a position to confirm that these are the wanted suspects. Let's return to our top story, what the RCMP called a credible tip 
led dozens of police officers and military assets to a garbage dump outside York Landing, Manitoba today. That's about 90 kilometers southwest of Gillen, where police had been searching. 18-year-old Briar Schmigelski and 19-year-old Cam McLeod are wanted in the murders of three people in northern B.C. Since then, the pair has driven across four provinces evading police. Let's take a look at the timeline. They're just kids on an adventure. Like, they're good boys. Two and a half weeks ago, Friday, July 12th, Briar Schmigelski sent his dad a text. There was no hint anything was amiss. He said he and his friend Cam McLeod were headed into Alberta and that he'd be in touch. A day later, Australian Lucas Fowler and his American girlfriend, China Deese, stopped at this gas station in Fort Nelson, BC, the carefree couple on a road trip through Canada. But two days later, about 20 kilometers south of Liard Hot Springs, Fowler's blue van was spotted broken down on the side of a remote highway. Fowler and Deese were found nearby, shot dead. We still don't know the motive. It's a love story that's ended tragically. It really is it's the worst ever love story. You know, mom can only be as happy as her saddest child, and I have three broken kids. Schmigelski and McLeod were still on the move. On Thursday, July 18th, they were north of Dees Lake, stopping for coffee at the Cassiar Mountain Jade store. But the next day, something went wrong. 50 kilometers south on Highway 37, McLeod and Schmigelski's truck was found abandoned, burning at the side of the road. About two kilometers away, UBC lecturer Leonard Dick was found murdered. He loved the marine environment, and so he focused all his attention on that. Um, but he also was really focused on his family. Three violent killings and two missing men in a short time span raised fears of an active serial killer. But we'd soon learn McLeod and Schmigelski were not victims of crime. We now know three days later, Sunday, July 21st, the pair had made their way to northern Alberta. Their vehicle got stuck on a trail in the Cold Lake area, and police say a resident later recalled helping the men get back on the road. Later that same day, a short drive east, Schmigelski and McLeod were spotted in a store in Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan. By Monday, they were in northern Manitoba, spotted by First Nations police doing an unrelated roadside check. That night, their vehicle was found in flames. We sat here for like 45 minutes before anyone even got here. They could have been sitting in a bush watching us. The RCMP isn't confirming whether it had been stolen from Leonard Dick, but the next day, this dramatic announcement from the RCMP. Cam and Breyer are no longer considered missing. The RCMP are now considering Cam McLeod and Breyer Schmigelski as suspects. The RCMP manhunt moved through the forest near Gillum, a huge number of officers and equipment. But as far as we know, the search has not turned up any sign of the suspects. But late yesterday afternoon, that possible sighting, what police are calling a credible tip near York Landing. Last night at approximately 5 p.m., the RCMP received a tip that two males matching the description of the wanted suspects were seen in York Landing Manitoba. Based on the information received, the RCMP immediately deployed multiple resources to the community. But tonight, the trail has gone cold, the suspects still at large, and it's been a week since the last solid lead. York Landing is uh, more than three and a half hours by car from Gillum. It's not easy to get to. You need a boat or take a ferry from the community of Split Lake. And communications like cell phones don't always work there. So for that reason, we've asked the CBC's Austin Gravish to remain in Split Lake tonight to help keep us up to speed. I spoke with him a little earlier this evening. Austin, you've been covering the search for a few days now, so we thought we'd get a sense of some of the challenges for police. Uh, let's begin with the weather. Well, Ian, the weather tonight is a lot nicer than it's been in recent days. Uh, you know, searchers have been having to go through heavy rain. It's been heavy torrential downpour for multiple days. Driving conditions have been really rough and bugs have been really uh, quite extreme up here in, in northern Manitoba as this manhunt uh, continues. Things seem to be turning around tonight. You know, I'm in a shirt tonight. Uh, it's, it's warm where we're standing in Split Lake, but that's certainly not been the case in the Gillum area. 
Okay, let's talk about the bugs. Lots of Canadians have stories about bugs, but, but y you say it's particularly mm -hmm. bad up there. It's the worst I've ever seen, and I'm from Manitoba. You know, last night when we were at the airport and it was raining and windy, and, it, you know, in recent days the, the bugs were so bad that we'd look up and it seemed like there'd be like 10,000 bugs above you, and we'd see these RCMP officers going into the woods wearing mosquito nets around their faces. Um, even if you put on bug spray, and like the good kind, the heavy-duty kind, the bugs would still swarm you. So you've got to wonder if these guys are still out there, how they're coping with those uh, bugs up here. In northern Manitoba. So they may be out there. The suspects may also be, you know, just outside one of the, the communities there. And, and, and how are the residents coping? Yeah, you know, the, the residents uh, around here have given us a consistent message in every community we've gone to. Tonight we're in Split Lake. It's the first day we've been here, but we've spent most of our time in, in Gillum and in Split Lake today. Uh, the police being here was a new scene for, for residents. They're not used to that. It's a quiet northern Manitoba community. People here are very friendly. And when all of those police officers started coming through here to get to York Landing, which is just behind me, a ferry ride away behind me, uh, it made Made people feel on edge. Take a listen to one resident. Well, it's causing a lot of fear and anxiety, like with the people around here. And York Landing is so close to us. The only way to get there is through the ferry. Austin, something you must have thought about. You look on a map, and it just doesn't make sense to me that two people running away from the law would end up almost basically at the end of the road in, in northern Manitoba. What's your view of that? It's the question everyone wants to know up here is why did these guys come here and what could have brought them here? You know, it's the talk of the town at the coffee shop in the morning. We were talking with residents the other day when we were door knocking and one guy told me, you know, you don't come to Gillum for nothing. You come here if you know someone. And uh, it really just has fueled a lot of speculation in the town. Could someone have helped them potentially? Could someone be helping them hiding? These are all possible scenarios that the RCMP continue to investigate. And it's really a question that everyone has. What brought them here? And of course, the other scenario is maybe they're just on the run and weren't thinking and have run out of road. Uh, nobody has those answers for now. Austin Gravish in Split Lake, Manitoba tonight. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And of course, we'll remain live standing by throughout the evening on The National. And we'll bring you the latest developments on this story as soon as we get them. But next on The National, after decades together, Canadian couples can find themselves split up when looking for long-term care. You want to be together? Yes, that's the way I feel, yes. That's what you want? That's the, what I want. Is that being it, offered to it, you? No, that is not offered to me. Next, we'll go to a country doing things differently in spaces specially designed to keep couples together. Here's some other stories we're following tonight on The National. China is speaking out for the first time on anti-government protests in Hong Kong. In a rare news conference, Beijing accused those involved of committing, quote, evil and criminal acts. The Chinese government reiterated its support for Hong Kong's and battle leader Carrie Lam, while accusing Western countries of fanning the flames of dissent. Terrifying scenes today on the Ottawa River. Police say those on board did manage to jump to safety. Fire crews arrived shortly after they did extinguish the flames, and all of this is being investigated. And investigators say it could be days before they know the cause of this fire. It destroyed an inn on Prince Edward Island near Brackley Beach. It started on the outside of the North Winds Inn yesterday before spreading. It left just a pile of rubble today. Good news is everyone managed to get out safely, though one person did suffer some minor burns. Nearly 7% of Canadians over the age of 65 are in a long-term care facility. And the cost of these facilities can be steep, financially and otherwise, too. You see, for a lot of patients, long-term care means being separated from their spouses after spending a lifetime together. But there are alternatives. Tonight, we go back to Sweden, where David Common got a look at a very different approach. <laughs> Hey. 
Every morning since the ambulance came for her husband begins just like this for Martha Farnell. I always leave here between 7.30 and of course, so I'd be there in time to give him breakfast. For 66 years, they've been together, beginning with a life in the military and eventually settling in Calgary, always together. But at 89, dementia and then a fall have pushed Willard first into hospital and now a long-term care facility. Martha is with him as often as she can be, even when he's napping. She can still live independently, doesn't need the level of help he does. And that means it's much harder to stay together in a system just not designed for couples. You want to be together? Yes. That's the way I feel, yes. That's what you want? That's the, what I want. Is that being it, offered to uh, you? No, that is not offered to me because they say there's nothing wrong with me. What do you worry about? He's just going to deteriorate so fast without me. He will because he just depends on me for everything. Martha's story is one you may have heard before. Oh, thank you. Across Canada, couples are routinely separated when one needs more help. As long as I've heard it. Reuniting them under one roof can take months, even years, if it happens at all. In Sweden, separation is almost unheard of. The system there built to recognize the value of keeping loved ones together. In fact, couples there have the right to live together. What would it mean for you at this stage in your life to not be together? I would not feel me lonely if I was at home and Torsten was here on the same way. I thought it would mean more for Torsten that we would be together. After decades together, Nancy and Torsten can't imagine life apart. A debilitating stroke may have robbed him of mobility and speech, but he hasn't lost her. He cannot live independently, but in Sweden the system is set up so he doesn't have to face old age alone. After that, Torsten fixed his stroke. Så bodde han hemma, så vårdade vi honom hemma i cirka åtta månader. Och det hade jag fortsatt med om jag inte hade fått detta erbjudandet. Att vi hade möjlighet att bo tillsammans. För vi får ju bättre hjälp här än hemma. Hjälpen finns på andra sidan dörren när vi behöver det. Och det ger en stor trygghet. It would be too much for her to handle alone at home. But here at a care home where both can live, help is never far away when it's needed. Talar om för personalen att jag är borta mellan klockan så och så. Och de tar hand om Torsten under tiden. Ska han lägga sig och vila så kommer de. Ska han upp så kommer de också på fasta tider. Det går väldigt bra. They aren't the only exception in Sweden. This is the rule. Couples stay together, not just until one can no longer care for the other, but until the end. Hello. Hello, hello. Hey. Hey. Ruth, David. Hey, Ruth. Ruth, good to meet you. Ruth and her husband of six decades lived here. Now, though, she's in mourning. It's only one bed now. Her husband passed away last week. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. So now she feels it's it's a little bit big for her, the apartment. It's, it's hard now. Hard now, certainly. But imagine how much harder had Ruth and Horner been separated. In Canada, it would have been a near certainty. In Sweden, it would have been seen as a failure. For Sweden, this is as much about maintaining companionship as anything else. So these are brand new? Yes. Take these new apartments designed for two. Nice. 
So who are these designed for? It's for people so they can stay along, uh, together longer. Like a couple? Uh, yeah, a couple. Uh, or if you have a best friend you want to stay with, or a child or something. There's a lot of life thing going on. Driven forward in a partnership between IKEA and the country's queen, they are specifically designed to ease the symptoms of dementia. It's a timer on the outlets. You can also install for the water, so you don't leave it running. Andreas so Melkerson is a nurse here. Here, light switch. Oh yeah, it's almost like a little night light, but yeah. it's on all the time, right? Blinds to avoid mirroring from the windows. Yes, if you see yourself in the window, it can scare a person with dementia. As people live longer, more with dementia, Sweden is rising to meet the challenge of this growing disease. It's a lot of contrast here as well. Without cutting people apart. We want to do something new here. And this is that new thing? This, this is the new thing. And with plans for more, a safe environment where being together is itself a form of care. Keeping lives together as one just seems like the right fit. What would you say to a country like Canada that don't have couples staying together in their later years of life? It can not be better when you are in a difficult situation. Så är det det bästa som kunde hända oss i alla fall. Den där kan du ta kanske. The circumstances are ideal for Nancy in Sweden. But not currently an option for Martha in Canada. This is Alkani and soldiers where we are picnicking. Even as she flips through decades of memories, she's now focused on her future and asking health authorities why Canada and Sweden are so different. I said, why don't you start doing something in Canada? Why can't Canada change the system? A little bit behind. This is some of our gatherings that we always had in there. And so she'll keep fighting to be with Willard, pushing for the rare rooms for two, a place to both care for her husband and live with him. I want to be there with him, do stuff for him. And then, that's my main objective in that. I've often said that I said when, I, when I knelt down before God and says until death do us part, I thought man that we've written each other letters and that's what we both have in, in our letters that this is what we want. We want to be together till the end. Martha knows that may not be long for Willard. Yeah. She's intent on keeping what she yeah. sees as a promise to him and to herself. David Coleman, CBC News, Calgary. And next on the National Hour Moment, a teenager springs into action after a frightening accident. It's a tough little girl, you know, go through something like that. A dramatic story from the neighbor who flew in to help. Next. Earlier today, near Enfield, Nova Scotia, that's not far from the Halifax airport, this SUV was hit by a freight train. It landed on its side in a ditch. The window shattered, the roof badly damaged, and trapped inside a woman and a 13-year-old girl. It's a story that could have turned out tragically if it hadn't been for the teen's quick thinking. What happened next is tonight's moment. She's a miracle. God was with her. Nick Greener lives near the scene of the accident. He happened to be at home when the teen somehow managed to crawl out of the vehicle and go looking for help. Came knocking on the door. And so I got up and come out right away. Well, she just didn't know what happened. She, she, she felt like it was like a dream. I sat her down and told her she had to stay there with me, give her some water. And she was in shock. Greener says he went down to the vehicle. He, he found the driver still trapped inside. And I couldn't get at her, but I could see that she was breathing. Called the, the phone numbers that we had to call and get, get the emergency here. Firefighters said it was difficult to get the driver out. Both she and the teenager were taken to hospital and were told both are going to be okay. I did. feel pretty shot, shook up about what happened here. Um, it's, it's a tough thing to see. Just thank God that she's still alive, you know? Because it could have went the other way. 
So Andrew, obviously our moment because there's a lot to be thankful for and that teenager did such a terrific job. But boy, like, you know, you drive around in rural Canada and it's so easy to, to make a mistake at a railway crossing. I don't know how fast the train was going, but the maximum speed for freight trains there apparently is just over 100 kilometers an hour. Yeah, well, and just case in point of, of how wrong things can go. I mean, that particular crossing didn't have any barriers as such, right? Just, just signs, and so it's something that's easy to miss. And there have actually been other train accidents mm -hmm. uh, involving cars in that particular area, one last year, in fact. So uh, as you pointed out, I mean, things clearly ended badly, but it could have been much worse than that. That's The National for this Monday, July 29th. Have a good night. Good night.